Eye contact indicates interest, and it also indicates, at least in principle, the possibility of approach. And so approach is, a, is dopaminergically mediated, and it's a positive emotional state. And that's also why, interestingly enough, if you go into a, into a uh, pharmacy, and there's a rack of magazines, and there are, what's on the cover? Always, almost always. Beautiful woman. Like, on 50% of the men's magazines, there's a beautiful woman, and on like 100% of the women's <laughs> magazines, which is really interesting, you know, because you might think, well, why is that? Well, and the woman's eyes are always looking out in a way that they're looking at you. So, there was some interest. So, it's an invocation of interest. And so, you know, magazines evolve. All the ones that don't get bought fail. And so what's happened is they all converge to the same point. And the same point is the thing that's maximally interesting to a magazine purchaser is a, fem is a beautiful female face, whether it's male or female. Now, on the male side, there's also gadgets of all sorts. So, and that may be because men are more gadget-oriented than women. So, anyways. And we also know that, for example, with men, if you show them, this is a funny little study. So you show them a the, the face of a beautiful woman, and her eyes are looking that way, or this way, or they're looking right at him. You can check the activity in the dopaminergic center in a place called the nucleus accumbens. Face on eye contact, that thing lights up. It lights up even more if she's wearing a red dress. <laughs> right, and you can get the same kind of lighting up with a red curvy sports car. <laughs> yeah. So it's uh, you know my 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 thought when I when I when I read that was the perfect situation is like a beautiful girl dressed in red perched on a sports car. <laughs> why, why red? Why red? Why red? Yes. That's a good that's a good question. I'm not exactly sure why. Oh, that's wrong. I do know why red. <laughs> ripe fruit. <laughs> Women have co-evolved with ripe fruit. <laughs> It's very sneaky of you, by the way. So that's why you know that, too. You just have to leaf through a woman's magazine. And the lipstick is always associated with, like, apples that are glistening in some way, or a peach or something like that. And we're, we were primarily fruit eaters. And the reason we have color vision is to detect fruit, ripe fruit. And so part of the reason that, also part of the reason that fruit turns red or colored when it ripens is because the fruit that was successfully eaten by creatures that distributed the six seeds was the fruit that was ripe when it was eaten. And so as the color vision evolved, maybe there was a red tint for God only knows what reason, then a positive feedback loop developed, and fruit got redder and redder, and at the same time, women capitalized on that. So that's partly, I think, what explains the association between Eve and the apple in, in, the, in Genesis. Because Genesis is also a story about gaining sight. So, yeah, so that's why red. So that's pretty funny. I really think that's pretty funny. So, you know, evolved, mod, evolved sensory significance is absolutely everywhere, you know, and it, it's so deep inside of us. Yeah. yeah. I'd have to wonder about blood, too. It seems like it also... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Red's a significant color. But I think, I mean, and it's funny, too, because say, say there's a flushed face. Well, that means it's infused with blood. It's also a sign of health. Did I tell you about the, the t-shirt study of symmetrical men? Oh, that's a funny one. So, <laughs> yeah, so we know that one of the things that signifies physical beauty is symmetry, right? Because, and the reason for that is that all things considered, symmetrical people are more healthy than asymmetrical people. Asymmetry indicates that something's gone wrong somewhere in the process of development. So we like symmetry in beauty. And, uh, and that's fine, and that's all the way across the animal kingdom. So butterflies, there are butterflies that won't mate with another butterfly if it deviates from symmetry some absurdly tiny amount. Like, really, it's, it's, micro, it's micro measurement deviation. I guess they have a butterfly template, and if, you know, if the, the potential mating butterfly doesn't match, it's like, flitter off, you know. <laughs> You're not getting anywhere. So... So that's fine, but symmetry. So uh, this researcher, God only knows what possessed him. He took a bunch of men, ranging from symmetrical to asymmetrical, you know, judged by a panel, and then he had them shower, and then he had them wear a T-shirt for like four hours, and then all of them. And then he gave these T-shirts to women and said, okay, rate these, the, the, the scent of the T-shirt from, you know, 
positive to negatives. Like, well, the women overwhelmingly preferred the symmetrical guys. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, no kidding, eh? So you just bloody well never know what's, what's behind that attraction. You know, we know something. Symmetry is a big one, but there's a bunch of other ones too. You know, because what we know about the expectancy models is that a deviation from expectation produces a burst of negative emotions. You know, so you come home and the whole house is clean, but there's like, I don't know, the dog has shed on the rug or something, and the person overlooked that. It's like, you're not going to see the clean house. You're going to see the rug with the dog fur on it. You're going to say, why didn't you clean up the rug with the dog fur? And they're going to say, good luck getting me to clean up the house again. <laughs> and, you know, because the thing is, is the exception stands out. And what's done doesn't. And the reason for that is you can just ignore what's done. Because it's done. It doesn't get in your way. So it gets invisible really quickly. So you really got to watch that tendency. One of the things Nietzsche said was that if you really want to punish someone, you don't punish them when they do something wrong. Because they expect that. That's not a punishment. They expect that. They might even be relieved by it. <laughs> you want to punish them when they do something right. Because then you'll really hurt them. And so that's something to think about. In your, if you're in a relationship, man, if someone's done something right, do not punish them. You do that two or three times, and that's it. man. you're not going to get them to, to do that anymore. So judiciousness watch what they're doing if something happens that good that's good notice it and you know if they've done a bunch of things don't concentrate on the things they did wrong that's not smart it, it's really hard on them too like it, this in some sense this sounds manipulative and selfish you know because I'm teaching you how to train your partner but <laughs> but you should also teach them how to train you because it would be really nice if you could come home and the person would say, well, what did you do today? And you say, you know, here's a bunch of things I did. And they say, you, they say well, this looks really good and that was great. And why don't you do some more of that? And you're like, oh boy, it was a great day. And so, you know, you can train them to train you properly. And that's a really helpful thing, especially if you do it over a few years. You know, you can, that's how you have a good relationship because you're both clueless as hell to begin with. You don't know even what would make you happy, much less what would make the other person happy. And so you've got to figure these things out bit by bit, and then you have to inform each other, and then you have to be patient enough to let your partner do these things really badly. I'll, I'll give you another example. Sometimes, sometimes I, I see couples sporadically in my, in my clinical practice. I'm not a couple's counselor. And so, but sometimes... When I'm working with someone, there's an issue that needs to be discussed with, with both people, because otherwise it's just stupid. And one of the things I often recommend to people, especially once they have kids, is that they set aside, to use an anachronistic phrase, date, date nights. Well, everyone hates that idea. It's like they say, well, you know, they'll just say, that's, I'm not doing that. That would be one objection. We're just not doing that. You know, that's what we did before we got married. Um, they'll say, well, my partner would never go for that. Um, they've got a bunch of excuses why that isn't going to work. And so I've heard all those excuses. I know all of them. And then maybe I convince them, yeah, yeah, sure, I know, this is stupid. It's awkward. It's, it's, it's uh, artificial. That's okay. Just try it once. So then they go and try it, and then they come back and they say, we had an absolutely miserable time. Really, we had a miserable time. We couldn't agree on what movie to go to, and then, you know, she took me to her movie, and I really didn't like it. And so we fought all the way home. We're never doing that again. And I say, well, really, you've got 30 years, 400 days, that's 12,000 days. Okay, so you're not going to do that. You're going to spend the next 12,000 days without having any real romantic evenings and interactions with your spouse. That's your plan. And I like doing, I like doing arithmetic with my clients. Hey, they hate that. They hate, arithmetic. they hate arithmetic. It's like, well, no, that sounds like a bad idea. I said, okay, well, would you like some romance in your life, or are you just done with that? Well, well really, like, you know, people can go for a long time with no romance at all. I say, well, no, maybe we'd like some of that. Well, how much? Once a year. Well, no. Once a month. Well, no. Once every two weeks. Well, sometimes people are really busy. It's like, okay, that beats the hell out of zero. Once a week, twice a week. Okay, whatever. We're going we're gonna to start with a range. Okay, what would a good evening look like? Like if you could both get exactly what you wanted, 
what would it look like? Well, then they have to think about that because the, the previous theory was my stupid partner should know what I like and that's what their, the partner is thinking too. It's like, good luck with that because no, they don't have a clue, especially if they're men, they don't have a clue. <laughs> so you have to tell them what you want and how they could deliver it and vice versa, which is very awkward and horrible. And then you have to practice it for six months because, you know, it takes a lot of practice to do something sophisticated really well. 